Welcome to Meeple Mentor. I'm Jared, and we are about to play Lost Ruins of Barnack. Let's take a look. I'll show you how. Feel free to pause the video as needed to follow along with your copy of the game. For your convenience, I've added chapter timestamps in the description to the different sections of the tutorial. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell below the video so you don't miss any of my latest content. The Lost Ruins of Arnak is a thematic Eurogame that taps into the Indiana Jones feeling of adventure, exploration, and fun. Through the game mechanisms of deck building and worker placement, players will explore a new uncharted island full of rugged plateaus and a verdant jungle. Upon arriving to Arnak, tents are put up near fresh water to create a base camp. Your archaeologists have their own color tents to occupy, and resources gained are kept in crates. Perhaps they've encamped on sacred ground. What wonders or creatures lie ahead on this island? How dangerous is it here? Through this expedition, the island will be explored, researched, and charted to discover its secrets. Within the wild jungle, find mysterious artifacts, intriguing archaeological sites, helpful items, and maybe discover the lost temple of Arnak. But beware of the guardians that lurk at every turn. Your expedition's accomplishments and discoveries will be measured with points at the end of the game to determine which player has led the most successful expedition. The main board has two sides, a bird temple side and a snake temple side. For your first game, it's recommended to use the bird temple side face up. You'll see a large bird's artwork in this area of the board. Place the moon staff near the top of the board underneath number one. These Roman numerals and staff will indicate which round you're in. Add the supply board underneath the main board. Find the fear cards and place them face up in a deck in the center of the top of the board. Separate the artifact cards, which are blue and have this vase in the corner. Shuffle them together and place the deck face down in the top left space of the board. Now find the item cards, which show a trowel icon in the upper right of the cards. Shuffle them together and place their deck face down in the top right space of the board. Now reveal one artifact card from its deck and place it face up to the left of the moon staff. Next, deal five cards out to the right from the moon staff. All these cards are available to players to purchase in the game. Create a pile of the idle tiles. Mix them up as best you can and one by one add them to the center of the game board on the indicated spaces for them. The level 1 locations have them placed face up. In the topmost level 2 area, two idle tiles are placed, one face up and one face down. Depending on how many players are in the game, some spaces will need to be blocked. These action spaces will not be available during your game. In a 3 player game, three tent sites are blocked showing two boots. Mix the tokens up and flip over three at random. Those will be the spaces blocked in the campsite area. Just place them over the double boot space, corresponding to the action on the token. Place them face down. The unused tokens can return to the box. In a two-player game, place all five blocking tokens over each of the double boot action spaces. Next, you'll set up the temple tiles at the top of the temple research track. The 11 point tiles sit at the top with two 6 point stacks in the middle and three 2 point stacks at the bottom. The number of tokens in each stack matches the number of players in your game. So in a 3 player game there will be 3 point tiles in each stack. Now take all the research bonus tiles and mix them up. Place a stack face down at the top of the research track equal to the number of players in your game. Then place one from the remaining supply face up on each square research space on the track. Note that spaces with this four player icon only get a tile there in a four player game. Likewise, spaces with the three player icon are only used in games with three or four players. Return any unused tiles to the box. Let each player choose a color to be from the four available. They are identical except for the color. You'll take the player board, two archaeologist figures, two research tokens, and the four starting cards in your color. Keep the board in front of you and place the meeples on it. The first time you play the game, you'll need to apply the stickers to the notebooks and magnifying glass tokens. 
the square tokens are the notebooks. Now each player takes two fear cards from the fear card deck. Shuffle your four basic cards and the two fear cards together to form a deck. Place your deck on your player board on the left. On the supply board, there are spaces for each type of resource. Create piles of the resources in their corresponding spaces. Separate the level 1 and level 2 site tiles. Shuffle each stack as best you can and place them on the supply board face down. The level 1 site tiles on the left and the level 2 site tiles on the right. Then take all the large guardian tiles and shuffle them into a stack. Place it face down between the site tiles. The assistant tiles are these smaller rectangular tiles with art of various people. Each has a silver side and a gold side. Turn them all to the silver side and shuffle them together. Create three equal stacks placed above the guardian tiles. There should be four tiles in each stack. Above them, each player should place their notebook and magnifying glass research tokens on one of the spaces. These will both be used to move up the research track during the game to gain rewards and points. The first player of the game will be the person who most recently traveled to a place they have never visited before. Or you can randomize it in whatever method you want. The first player gains the first player marker, which looks like an alarm clock. From the supply board, each player gains a certain amount of different resources. The first player gains two coins. The second player gains one coin and one compass token. The third player gains two coins and one compass token. The fourth player gains one coin and two compass tokens. You can put these action tiles back in the box as they are only used in a solo game. With that, you're set up and ready to play. The game plays through five rounds, which will be kept track of at the top of the board with the moon staff. A single round will let players take varying amounts of turns, depending on what they do. There are free actions available to do on their turn, as well as main actions. Any number of free actions can be done, while you are limited to one main action per turn. Then play passes to the next player. Turns go around and around until everyone has passed. At the start of the round, all players draw from their personal decks until they have a hand of 5 cards. Play always starts with the player with the first player token. Players take turn after turn doing one main action at a time, combined with any number of free actions. When it comes to your turn and you feel you are done taking main actions this round, you must pass. You are then out for the remainder of the round. On your final passing turn, you may still do free actions. Once everyone passes, proceed to setting up the next round. Everyone will collect their archaeologist meeples from the board back to their player board. Anytime you return one of your meeples from a space with a guardian, you must also take a fear card and place it in your play area. If you have cards left in your hand, you may choose to discard them to the play area or keep them for the next round. However, it's best if you can use as many cards as possible in a round. All cards in player's play area are shuffled together and put on the bottom of their player deck. Any used assistance should then be tapped upright again. Don't worry, I'll explain more on that later. Pass the first player token to the next player clockwise. Then look at the cards next to the moon staff. Discard both of these to their respective discard piles and then move the moon staff marker forward to the next round number. Then you'll fill the empty spaces with new cards off the top of the decks. The left side spaces are refilled with artifact cards. In later rounds, you'll need to slide remaining artifact cards down to the right towards the staff before refilling the spaces. Before starting the next round, everyone should draw up to five cards in their hand. If your deck doesn't have enough cards to make a full hand, just draw them all. After the fifth round, players take their archaeologists back and gain fear cards from any guardians at their space. Then skip the rest of the steps and proceed to endgame scoring. There are several kinds of resources you'll be using in the game. Coins and compasses are the easiest to get, with jewels being the hardest. The coins represent funding for your expedition, and are primarily used to buy items from the item card display. Compasses represent time and energy spent exploring the island. These are mostly used to pay for and discover artifact cards and discover new archaeological dig sites. The tablets represent various ancient texts that you can decipher. They are often used to trigger artifacts gained. The arrowheads represent remnants of weapons you discover. They are often necessary to overcome the guardians around the island. The red jewels are mysterious talismans of the bird god Ara Anu. 
They are the most difficult to find, but are often essential for completing your research into the mysteries of Arnak. Each card has a travel value depicted as an icon in the upper left corner. Each card can be used to pay for travel actions like dig at a site. There's a hierarchy of travel icons, and the lowest value is the boot icon. Above that are the buggy icon and boat icons. With these two at the same value, they cannot substitute for each other. The highest valued travel icon is the airplane. The airplane icon can pay for any travel icon required, while the buggy and boats can also be used as boots. As a free action, you may always choose to pay two coins to gain an airplane travel icon for the purposes of paying a travel cost. Action spaces on the board will depict one or more of these travel icons, which is the cost that must be paid. Just play one or more cards as needed to your play area to pay this. When using a card for the travel icon, you do not get the card's main ability in the center. Your play area is basically a spread out discard pile near your player board. Anywhere you see the lightning bolt icon, it indicates it's a free action. Your starting cards have free actions like gaining a coin or compass from the supply. Free actions can be done before, after, or even during your main action of your turn. The fear cards don't have an effect, but can still be used as a boot travel icon. Now we'll look at the various main actions you can do in the game. There are six main actions possible you can do on your turn, plus passing. Remember, you can only do one of these per turn. To dig at a site means to send your archaeologist to one of the camp's tent sites or an already explored dig site on the board. You have two archaeologist meeples to use per round to take this action. Meeples already placed cannot move again. The action spaces will have one or more travel icons on them, with a circle to indicate where the meeple goes. Only one meeple can occupy an action space at a time. Choose which action you want to take from the empty ones available and pay the travel cost shown by playing one or more cards. The cards must be able to pay the cost with the icons in their corner. Move your archaeologist to the action space and resolve its effect. In the campsite area, there are five action areas. The first gives you two coins. The second gives you two compasses. This one, two tablets. This one, one arrowhead. And the final one gives you a jewel, but you must play a card for no effect. The effects of action spaces are usually self-explanatory, but the back of the rulebook has a full list of the iconography found in the game. To gain more action spaces on the board, players must explore and discover the new sites. To discover a new site, choose an empty wilderness area. There are level 1 and level 2 wilderness areas. Depending on where the site is located, you must pay a number of compass tokens. The level 1 sites require 3 compasses, while the topmost level 2 sites require 6 compasses. Pay them back to the supply. Pay the travel value shown by playing one or more cards that match or have a higher value, and then place one of your two available archaeologists on the action space. You may also choose to pay two coins for an airplane icon, which pays for any one travel icon. After moving your meeple there, take any idol tokens present there. You'll gain both idols at the level 2 sites, but you won't be able to use the effect of the face down one. Resolve the idol's immediate effect shown on it, which is usually gaining a resource. Keep your collected idols face down on your player board over the supply crates. Next, take the top tile from the stack of discovery sites that matches the level of your site. Place it face up on the board above your meeple. This site is now considered discovered, and you should immediately gain whatever benefits are shown on the bottom of the site tile. Lastly, you must awaken a guardian. Draw the top tile from the guardian stack and place it face up on top of the site tile. The Guardian won't immediately affect you, but if it's still there at the end of the round when you collect your Meeple, you must take a Fear card. The Fear card gets shuffled with your played cards and put under your deck. Guardians will stay round to round until someone defeats them. Also, any time during the game you should collect a Fear card but the Fear deck is empty, you should instead take a Fear tile. Keep it near you. It will be worth negative two points at the end of the game. When you are allowed to exile a card, you may choose to exile the fear tile instead. After a site has been discovered, players may go there without paying the compass cost. The compasses are only required to discover new sites. The idols you collect on your crates will be face down since their one-time discovery reward has already resolved. Each one will be worth three points at the end of the game, but they still have a use for you. 
As a free action, players may slide one of their idle tiles over the leftmost empty idle slot on their player board. You may choose one of the five benefits on the left. However, by doing this, you've covered up points on your player board. At the end of the game, any visible victory points among these four slots will give you points. By covering them up, you'll be missing out on those points. The possible bonuses you can gain by placing an idol here are shown on the left. The first one lets you pay one coin to gain a jewel. The next three let you gain the resources shown. The last one lets you draw a card from your deck. As a main action on your turn, you may attempt to overcome a guardian where one of your archaeologists are. Note that in a following round, you can go to the newly discovered site to get the benefit, even if a guardian is there. Then by being there, you may overcome the guardian as a later action that round. Either way, the bottom area of the guardian tiles have a cost to pay to overcome it. Look inside the red banner. As your main action for your turn, you may overcome the guardian by paying the cost shown. Then remove the guardian tile from the board and keep it near you face up. Some effects of actions, benefits, or cards may show this checkmark icon over the gold guardian symbol. Resolving this effect lets you overcome a guardian wherever one of your archaeologists is without paying its cost. You should still collect the guardian if defeating one this way. The upper right corner of the guardian tiles offer either travel values or a lightning bolt in actions shown. These are known as the guardian's boon which can be used once during the game as a free action. Only guardians you've defeated can be used for their boon effect. This can be done on the same turn or any future turn, but only once. To indicate you've used it, just flip it over for the rest of the game. Whether you use the guardian's boon or not, each defeated guardian will give you five points at the end of the game. As a main action, you may choose to buy a card from the display. It could be an artifact or item, but only from those face up. All these cards are worth victory points at the end of the game, as shown in the bottom right corner. Item cards are found to the right of the moon staff and have a trowel icon in the corner. When buying an item, pay the coin cost shown in the bottom left corner and take the card. Immediately place it on the bottom of your deck. Next, slide all the remaining cards inwards towards the moon staff to fill in empty spaces. Then, draw a new card from the top of its deck and place it in the empty space. When buying an artifact, slide remaining artifact cards inward to the moon staff and draw a new one from its deck for the empty space. All six card spaces should be filled. To purchase an artifact card, pay the compass cost shown at the bottom left corner. This represents the time spent exploring to find these valuable treasures. Unlike items, the artifact's ability is used as soon as you take it from the card row. Resolve the card's effect and put it in your play area. Whatever effect the artifact gives you is done immediately and is always considered part of this one main action, even if the effect lets you do another kind of action. If refilling cards to the card row but there are no more cards left in the deck, no more cards are ever drawn. The discard piles are never shuffled. The item cards you gain will have actions or effects in them that can be played on your turn as your main action. Other cards that have the lightning bolt icon are free actions and can be done in addition to a main action. Play the chosen card face up into your play area and resolve the card's effect. Artifacts also require you to pay the tablet cost when playing them in order to gain the effects. Paying this only applies when playing them from your hand for its effect, not when buying the card or using it for its travel value. Any played card for its effect cannot also be used for its travel value. The played card stays in the play area for the remainder of the round, unless it becomes exiled. Exiling a card is equivalent to trashing it and removing it from your deck permanently. Certain cards, effects, or abilities let you exile a card to the discard pile at the top of the board. Look for this symbol that has a red X over a card. You may exile cards from your hand or play area. You are allowed to play a card and then exile it, which is often a better option than exiling a card from your hand without first using it one last time. When exiling a fear card, put it back on top of the fear deck. Your starting funding and exploration cards should sit off the board near the fear deck when exiled. Exiled cards typically can't come back into play. Remember, if you have a fear tile, you may choose to exile that instead of a card. You may advance one of your research tokens on the research track as a main action. The research track is a long vertical track with varying paths you can take upwards. When researching, you'll get to advance up one level connected to where your token currently is. 
Since there are two research tokens in your color, you must choose which one to advance. However, the notebook may never move to a row above your magnifying glass token. Just remember that first you discover something, then you write it down. So magnifying glass first, then notebook. You can also choose to never advance your notebook and just move the magnifying glass up each time. I just don't recommend it. Note that multiple tokens from multiple players can all occupy the same space. There's no restriction or preventing others from also ascending. The cost to move up is shown by the resources in the rectangular bridge between the two levels. You must pay this back to the supply. After moving up, gain the rewards of researching. Should you move to a row with a bonus tile, you immediately gain the shown bonus and then remove the token from the game. So only the first player to get there gets the benefit of the bonus tile. Then always resolve the effect of the row shown to the right. The effect of the row depends on which token you've moved up. Look at the shapes on the right. The one that shows the outline of the magnifying glass shape holds the row effect for when your magnifying glass advances there. Likewise for the notebook and the square outline. You are allowed to resolve the row's effect before using the bonus tile if you want. You may also notice the victory points shown. At the end of the game, both of your tokens will earn the points shown for their highest row achieved. Additionally, the top of the track is known as the Lost Temple and has four empty spots for magnifying glasses. The first person to move their magnifying glass to the top of the track gets to place it in the most valuable spot, worth 23 points. When other players get there, they must take one of the other empty spaces for lesser points. Of course, not everyone may reach the end of this track. By reaching the end of this track, you'll immediately get to look at the stack of face-down tiles and choose one. Gain the benefit and remove it from the game. Your notebook cannot move to this top row. Once you've reached the Lost Temple space, you may now take a special research action of exploring the Lost Temple. As a main action, you may pay to take one temple tile from any one of the stacks above. You'll see three different costs you can pay shown at the bottom of this temple. For each cost you choose to pay, you can take a more valuable temple tile. So if you pay any one of these costs in full, you'll take a two-point temple tile. If you fully pay any two of the costs shown, you'll get to take one six-point temple tile. And by paying all three costs, you may take one 11-point temple tile. These stacks are limited, so if it empties, you may not take any. Most of the row effects of researching are to gain resources, but there are also research assistants that can be gained. Each player can gain up to two assistants during the game. The assistants are people who have come to join your expedition. Each one has a silver and gold side, with the gold being the stronger, upgraded version. On this side of the game board, moving your notebook up the research track will gain you assistance. Each silver icon lets you recruit one of the three face-up assistant tiles. When gaining it, place it on one of your two assistant spaces on your player board with the silver side up. The second assistant will occupy the second spot. When your notebook reaches the row with the gold icon as the reward, you get to flip over and upgrade one of your assistants. Once upgraded, it stays upgraded the rest of the game. Assistants often have a free action available on their tile as shown by the lightning bolt. Gain what's shown in the center of the tile and tap the tile sideways to indicate it's been used. This is known as being exhausted. Each can be used once per round unless an ability or effect lets you refresh it. These will automatically refresh at the end of each round. The reward shown at the bottom of an assistant gives you a preview of what their upgraded versions are. For example, this assistant lets you exile a card, but if it's upgraded, you also gain a compass token. One other special note about upgrading an assistant to gold is you may upgrade an assistant that has been exhausted and it will be refreshed on its gold side. Each assistant has different effects and uses, so if you have a question about what it does, check the back of the rulebook for the iconography. However, when you see a slash line between effects, you must choose one to gain, not both. The game ends after the fifth round of play. Players should still collect their archaeologists from the board and take any fear cards as normal if a guardian was at their site. You can skip other prep steps and go straight to final scoring. Included in the box is a score pad where you can write the player's names and points for each thing. If you want, you can write in the date in the upper left corner. First, each player looks at the points earned for the row each of their research tokens is on. The magnifying glasses in the Lost Temple row gain the points shown for the order they reached it. 
add them together, and write that down. Next, everyone adds up points from earned temple tiles. Score each one you collected the amount shown on the tiles. Next, add three points per idol you've collected, plus points shown in the empty idol slots on your board. Next, gain five points per guardian tile you've collected and overcame. It doesn't matter if you used its boon or not. Now, separate out all your cards into stacks of items, artifacts, and fear cards. Add up the points shown in the bottom corner of each item and artifact card. Lastly, count up each fear card you have. Each fear card is worth negative one point, while the fear tiles are negative two points. Sum up everyone's points and subtract the negative points to find the totals. Whoever has the most points at the end of the game wins. And if there's a tie, whoever reached the lost temple first wins. If no one reached the top row, then the player with the highest research score wins. If still tied, they share the victory. When using the snake temple side of the board, reference the rulebook on page 19 for some varied setup steps. The back of the game board is different and it offers different costs and effects on the research track as well as varying travel costs to the sites. This side can be more difficult and a little more complicated for new players. I recommend it after playing once on the bird temple side. Lost Ruins of Arnak can even be played solo if you're short on friends. Let's go over some of the changes and how that works. For the solo mode, collect the rival tiles back from the game box. Set up the board as you would normally for a two-player game, including the blocking tiles. Whenever a stack is supposed to have a number of tiles equal to the number of players, give it two tiles. Set up your board as normal, but you will play second, so you should start with one coin and one compass. Choose another player board to represent the rival expedition. Flip it to its gray tent side and give it all six archaeologist meeples not in your color. Only give it one research token, the magnifying glass. Now you'll create the rival action stack. You'll always use five action tiles. Select a combination of five red and five green action tiles. They are pairs of each other, with the red tiles being the more difficult or aggressive version. The number of red tiles you use in the game determines your difficulty from 0 to 5. You can choose which action tiles to include specifically, or randomize it. Then add in the missing green action tiles to have a full set of 5. The unused 5 tiles can return to the game box. Shuffle all the rival action tiles together into a face-down stack. During each round, the rival always goes first. Do not pass the first player token. On their turn, flip over the top action tile and set it beside the stack. Then resolve the action indicated. If it's not possible to resolve it, it does nothing on this turn. Alternate taking turns like you would normally during each round. The rival will not pass until they've played all their action tiles. They will collect points though, so let's look at each main action and how the rival performs it differently. Your rival will try to prevent you from getting the depicted resource from the various sites. Look for the site offering the shown resource and place a rival archaeologist there. If there are multiple sites that offer that resource, place the meeple in the site in a higher row. Within the same row, place the meeple at the site farther left or farther right as shown by the decision arrow. Whichever direction the arrow is pointing will tell you which site it would prefer. For this reason, make sure all the tiles are oriented so the dark edge is at the bottom. If the stack is empty, use the arrow found on the tile at the bottom of the used tiles pile. When one of these action tiles comes up, the rival will discover a level 1 or level 2 site. The round you're in will determine what it does. First determine the row for the site, giving preference to the bottom row. Then use the decision arrow to choose left or right. Place one of his meeples on the space and move the idol tokens to his board. If the face up idol is one he doesn't have yet, place it face up on the corresponding space on his board. If he collects a duplicate, put it face down on the space to the right labeled minus one. Multiple idols can stack there. Guardians don't come out automatically for the rival. Only on rounds where the guardian icon is shown will a guardian tile be placed with the site. 
On the fifth round, using the green action tile, the rival does nothing on this turn. The rival's research action tile lets him advance his magnifying glass to the next row. If there's a choice of paths, resolve it based on the decision arrow. If there's a bonus tile there, remove it from the game. If advancing to the lost temple, remove the top tile from the bonus tile stack from the game. Should the rival advance but already be at the top, give them a six point tile instead. Use the decision arrow to determine which stack to draw from. Then take the topmost assistant from the highest stack on the supply board. If tied, use the decision arrow and remove the tile from the game. The green action tile in round 5 does nothing. When the overcome guardian action comes up, he'll take a guardian off a site where one of his archaeologists is. He'll collect them on his board. In a tie between which site to take it from, use the decision arrow. If a rival doesn't have a meeple at a site with a guardian, he'll advance his research token instead. In the green version of the buy an item action, the rival takes the item with the lowest point value. In the red version, he takes the highest. Break ties with the decision arrow. He'll collect these cards on his board. Remember to refill the card display when done. The buying an artifact action tile works exactly the same as buying an item. Pretty straightforward. At the end of the round, return all the rival's archaeologists to their board, but do not give them any fear cards. Shuffle the action tiles into a new face-down stack for the next round. When scoring at the end of the game, the rival gets points for the position of their magnifying glass, temple tiles, guardians overcome, and cards purchased. For each unique face-up idol collected, give them three points. The idols in the negative one stack give only two points each. Compare the rival's total points with your own like normal. Whoever has the most points wins. There is a solo campaign for Lost Ruins of Arnak found on their website at www.arnak.game. The campaign offers multiple unique scenarios, new goals, and answers to what happened to the lost expedition of Professor Kutel. Keep the rulebook handy and check BoardGameGeek.com for FAQs and extra content. Check the video description for links to Cloud Puncher Games for board game shelving and Mr. Meeple t-shirts for cool board gaming shirts. The Meeple Mentor channel is now part of the board game community, The Gateway Network, made up of great upcoming board game content creators. Originally founded by the Gamecasters podcast, the network includes Instagrammers, podcasters, YouTubers, artists, and more. Click the link in the video's description or head over to the Gateway Network's Instagram to find great new content. Thanks for watching this tutorial. Like and subscribe if you found this teaching helpful. Stick around to watch another Learn to Play video. And remember, teach when you can, but always be learning. See you next time.